and various people uh, put their replies in there. And uh, I hope this is too good an opportunity to submit. Uh, they were very, very scriptural, and that was that was good. Um, so I'm saying, well, the, the call from Acts chapter th- two, verse thirty-eight. Uh, was important to them and some take various other things. And I thought, why did I become a Christian? And why am I still a Christian? Uh, most of you might know that just in January, we saw we left on our, our trip to, uh, to go to the other side of the world. The doctor told me that I was diabetic. And it's a bit like changing my religion. I used to be a Christian, but now I'm a diabetic. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and folks haven't got much of a clue what the difference it seems to me. But on Facebook, my reply was, God chose me. Uh, and I thought perhaps folks might think that that's rather presumptuous. But God did choose me. He chose me through the power of the gospel. In, in uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, we read, In him, that's in Christ, we were also chosen. And sometimes I get the feeling that the church is really down on itself. That was, uh, there can be quite a lot of talk about sin, and I hear constant prayers about forgive us our sins. But if I read my Bible right, God has already forgiven my sins. That's the whole point of Jesus dying on Calvary's cross. That he took my sins. What's the song say? He took my sins and my sorrows. He made them his very own. And because he has chosen me. Now I want to tell you something. Over the years, uh, being a Christian, I have tried repeatedly <coughs> to leave the Lord. But he won't let me. Uh, because love lifted me. Uh, and, and the bonds of love, he keeps on dragging me back. And I kind of think, well, well, you know, there's, there's, there's other people. Uh, well, why can't you, you get them to go and do all the things that I'm doing? He said, no, I've chosen you. And I said, well, I'm just a kid from Birmingham. Uh, on the back streets in Burnley, there was nothing special about me. And Jesus says, but you I died. And it doesn't matter where we've come from. And it doesn't matter what we know and what we don't know. And it doesn't even matter whether the angels went up or came down the land. God chose you and he chose me through the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. Because when Jesus hung on Calvary's cross, he so loved us. And will have us for his own if we will only have him. Now, uh, there's nothing like finding out that you're preaching or leading part in a, a meeting like this at half past ten uh, in the morning. Uh, and uh, so, this is what I've preached before. Alright, it was out of the folder. But I hope it might be a blessing to you. Now, uh, people say, well, what do you do? I say, well, I'm supposed to be retired. Uh, And wherever I am going, uh, we always say to come up to Sunday somehow or other, uh, and Sunday finds me in another congregation or another country or something. Uh, and God has opened up these fields to Paul and I for, for travelling, for going on all sorts of things. And people keep on asking me to preach. Why well, I don't know, they must be really desperate. But, but I keep on finding new congregations and I am worried. Now, Frankie made mention of this in, in, in your lesson and you have to end up by saying, God, it's your church and not mine. But I go around this country and have gone around a lot of other countries and find that the church belongs to certain people 
in those places. This is so and so's church. And that particular person will have things their way. And then I'm going to find churches that always do things a certain way. Uh, when I was growing up, uh, I loved the church at Summer Lane and still do. And I am continually thankful uh, for them. But every Sunday morning was the same. And I knew exactly when to stand and when to sit. I knew exactly what was coming up next. And it was, it was just like a prayer. Uh, and, and, and perhaps many of us have been in congregations where it's the same old, same old every particular Sunday. And you never, ever vary it. And I wonder if the early church was like that. Titus chapter 1 and verse 5 says this. The reason I left you in Crete was that you might strengthen out what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. And when I was rereading my notes on this, uh, the word straightened just jumped out and slapped me around the face this morning. Because if something had to be straightened out in the church, it meant that they was going a bit kinky. It was a bit off the mark. It was going round the end a bit. Uh, and, and sometimes our churches are like that. Now, I'm thankful that we are autonomous churches. That sounds a bit posh for Saturday lunchtime, doesn't it? We're supposed to be self-governing or look, looking after each other. We're supposed to be a flock uh, of God. Uh, in this particular place or that particular place and we don't have any headquarters but sometimes the way that folks talk and the way that folks write it seems as if there is a hierarchy telling the church is what to do and a hierarchy outside of that which is revealed in scripture and it seems to me that that's not right And I want us to think about that passage a little bit later on. And I want to introduce you to another verse. Uh, and it's, it's from Luke chapter uh, 2 and verse 49. Uh, and this particular occasion, Jesus had gone to the temple when he was a lad. And uh, I wonder what he was like as a lad. <laughs> Uh, the Bible Society produced uh, Matthew's Gospel. Uh, and uh, they asked, it's all out today, but all it is is Matthew's Gospel. Uh, and it's not Jesus walking around. Uh, and uh, some of it, the scenes are absolutely lovely. Uh, for instance, when the children run up to him, he picks them up and whirls them around and laughs with them. Well, I'm quite sure that Jesus, see, I mean, can you remember? Can you imagine Jesus being all sober, righteous, uh, and, 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 and kind of not looking his nose up in the air, saying, oh, little, little children, who can't come near me? I'm God. <laughs> but in Luke chapter uh, 2 and verse 49, we read these words. Why were you searching for me? He asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? The authorised version says, I need to be about my father's business. And I wonder if we are really taking God's business to heart. Now we've just supposed to have gone through a recession. Uh, and some people have made money in the recession. Some people have lost in the recession. And some people just don't know quite what's going on. Lots of people have changed jobs, go other places, all sorts of changes. But what business are we about? Now, uh, Jesus talking to his disciples, liken the church to a restaurant. Now you won't find the word restaurant in your Bibles, 
Uh, we were in, uh, in Camps Kinabalu, uh, serving the church there in Borneo in February. <coughs> and you'll find the word restaurant all over the place. Uh, now, we being here you know, sort of friends we drop the T in restaurants. But when they write it, they write it the way that they hear it. Restaurant. So it doesn't have a T at the end. Because you don't say it. So if you don't say it, why put it up there? It's real funny language, you know more. Because we, we learned a thing or two when we were members of the church in, uh, in Bristol with, uh, with L. Uh, the Bristol folks love to add L's to words. Uh, and so you can go for a walk. Uh, which, of course, probably is, is right because the, the R isn't there. Uh, we, don't, we don't say walk. Uh, or we do say walk, we don't say well. Uh, but I, we, we would go home, John, uh, and we would say, I've learned a new L word today. Because you said you can have potatoes, and umbrellas, and tomatoes, and you can have a hernia, uh, and, and, and all different sorts of things. Uh, and John's cousin, Brenda, was known as Brendel. Uh, and, and so they, they had an L. But, but you know, we, we add and we take away bits. But there's the restaurant in the Bible, or at least there should be. In John chapter 21, somebody like to turn to this and read a couple of verses for me. John chapter 21, verses 15 to 17. John chapter 21, verses 15 to 17. If you want to find it in your Bibles, verse 15. So what happened? Did I say to Simon? Simon, son of God, love thou me more than this? He said unto me, Yeah, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto me, Keep my hands. He said to him again, He said unto me, Simon, son of God, love thou me? He said unto me, Yeah, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto me, Keep my sheep. He said unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, Lord, let thou me. Peter was weak because he said unto me the third time, Lord, let thou me. And he said unto me, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou know that I love thee. Jesus said unto me, Feed my sheep. Very, very, I said unto you, When thou was young, thou wear thy sword, and walked with thy Thou this. When thou shalt be whole, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall go with thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. Thank you, thank you. Feed my sheep and eat my lambs. Now there's the church like a restaurant. Uh, you've all been to restaurants. Who likes to go to McDonald's? Well, I work with a cultured company in the world. Emergency food, if ever McDonald's was. But all over the world, there are restaurants, cafes. We had some pretty strange things while we were in, uh, in Kota Kina Balloon. Uh, one Sunday, we were going out, uh, the whole church were going out on a, 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 a ride somewhere. And so they. Uh, all, all the folks there were Chinese in the church. And so we went to a, a market where all the Chinese people were uh, and were given this bowl of, uh, of soup. Uh, I'm quite looking forward to it. If I do want, I can I'll just drop a soup. But there was a pink eyeball in there and a white eyeball in there and there was various other things in there that we had no idea about. Uh, and so the, the, the kind of liquid that flows on the top wasn't so bad, but when it came to the, the, the pink eyeballs and the white eyeball, I just wasn't so sure about that. It looked a bit odd to me. But uh, if you go to a restaurant and uh, your fork's dirty, you've got a bit of egg left in the front. Who's ever, ever had that? 
And yet I'll be in that horrible, you know, you pick up your thoughts, you just about to put your dinner in your mouth, and it's like the remnants of somebody else's dinner in there. Mm-hmm. How do you feel about that? Do you like it? Well, of course not. If you, if you saw a rat scurry by, would you be happy? Well, of course not. When I was a baker, we used to have the, the, the health folks come round every now and again uh, to make sure that, uh, that everything was clean in the bakery. Uh, and when I was a chef, we, we, we used to have to have uh, all sorts of things pulled out and clean underneath and the back of the oven because you just dare not have anything go wrong. But I wonder how often the church is a bit infested. I wonder if the food in the church is as good as what it could be. Now, you can tell I'm a man who has not skinned <laughs> on his food in life. Uh, I believe it's one of the great enjoyments in life. To, to sit and to eat and to, and to have fellowship. I believe that the table is one of the most important things in the house. But if the church was a restaurant, would people come back to the restaurant? Would people want to come back and be fed there? Would people enjoy what's on the menu? Now, uh, you and I have probably ended up somewhere or other and you could call the place the Greasy Sausage. Uh, who, can you remember last time you was in the Greasy Sausage? And, 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 and you know, you were sitting on your plate and you kind of think, I don't fancy this. I'm, I'm dead hungry, but I really don't fancy this. Or it's not cooked right, or it, it, and, uh, and it just doesn't look appetizing. Well, somehow or other, the church, it seems to me, needs to be about God's business of feeding people. Now, we, we, we have our physical feeding, but the spiritual feeding sometimes has a very, very narrow menu. Now, Frank, he preached the bulk of the, the Old Testament this morning. Are you going to preach the bulk of the New this no. afternoon? Not entirely. Not entirely, okay. <laughs> Uh, but, but how often have you been in a church meeting and it was the same menu as last week? Uh, and, and, and sometimes it would be the same hymns as last week. And when a brother so and so stands up and prays, you need to pray the prayer for him because he prays the same prayer every time. And, uh, and, and I'm making this a complaint in a number of places. We've whittled our prayer life in public down to basically four, four sentences. Thank you for letting us be here. Help us to do what's right. And we pray for those who aren't here. And perhaps one other that's tagged on. But with public prayer in many of our churches has been whittled down to four phrases. And I hate this. Because I think that we've come to God in the assembly to praise Him. And whether we want to use the word Yahweh or Lord or whatever, He's our Father. And we need to enjoy, and I'm going to challenge you men here, and you ladies, in your ladies' classes, and in your Sunday school classes, or whatever it is, start saying prayers, but ask God for nothing. Don't ask Him for a thing. Just praise Him. Just keep on thanking Him. Keep on honouring Him. And you'll find that it's really, really difficult. Because we've got some birds in the garden right now. Uh, I, I, I just love to see them there. They're falling down there every morning, feeding the birds. Uh, anybody got baby birds in their garden right now? Yeah, yeah, aren't they great? Love to see all these little, little babies uh, around that they're all there. They can, they can fly, they bless left the nest, they can fly, they know where the food is, they can eat the food, but what do they keep on doing? They keep on asking the parents 
for more food. A bit like teenagers, isn't it? <laughs> Dad, can I have some more money? When our only son was growing up, I always knew how much he wanted by the length of the A in Dad. If he was a quick dad, that was a cheap day. If he was a dad, then that was a really expensive. But what are we giving people in our congregations? What's the staff like in our congregation, in our, or the staff like in our restaurant? Uh, if you went into a, a restaurant, and then the waitress there, the staff, just ignored you, what would be your reaction? To walk out. And yet, over and over and over again, I've been the guest preacher in congregations, and sometimes they don't even know me there, and they just walk straight past them. Anybody else experience that? Well, how do our visitors to our restaurant, to God's business, how do our guests feel when they come in? Well, if, if we want to walk out of a restaurant, how many people would want to walk out of the church? Walk out of the meeting? Oh, I don't want to go there again. They couldn't even be bothered to speak to me. When I go on holiday, and there is, uh, and we're away from an area where one of our own assemblies is nearby, uh, I like to go into a place of worship, uh, preferably one that I'm not familiar with. Just to go in and experience something different. Uh, and, uh, and the service may well be completely, completely different. <coughs> there may be robes, it may not be robes. It may be organ, it may not be organ. It may be jazz band, it may not be. It might be all different sorts of things. But I'm going in there as a visitor, not knowing what to expect. And I've been into some places, and I've gone in and sat down, and I've walked out at the end of the service, and not one soul spoke to me. And I thought, if I want to enter into that place of worship, and I sat so low and I wanted to commit suicide, I'd have gone there and done it. Because the church didn't feed me. They couldn't even welcome me into that congregation. It's also been a blessing, actually in some places, but I've been welcomed uh, and, and made to feel encouraged. But what sort of a restaurant is your restaurant in your congregation? Secondly, somebody read for me Luke chapter 9 and verse 2. Luke chapter 9 and verse 2. And he said then to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Thank you. Now, it seems to me that we've got a sensitive world. And we've pushed healing the sick so far out of the door that we have lost. Now, I know Jesus was talking to the apostles here. But he said them to preach the word and to heal the sick. There are, there are an awful lot of people who are sick with life, sick with hurting, sick with broken relationships, sick with all sorts of hurt. And when they come to hear the gospel, the good news, then they need some healing. Now, while we were in Coach Kinabalu, uh, I had to go to a clinic one day and my toes started getting infected and they, they just diagnosed me with diabetes before we left England. And, uh, and so I had to go to the clinic. I'm keen on going to the clinic, I can tell you. But we went in, and it was like stepping back in time. Mm. Uh, oh, tell me I was a little lad. Uh, and eventually they, they, they mainlined me uh, with antibiotics. And then three nurses tried to put bandages on my toes. And my clue. They just put them on, they fell off. <laughs> so you can tell how much confidence I had by going there. But that was the only place that I could get some help. But if the church is a place of healing, is it bright? Is it clean? Is, are the patients being looked after? 
And is, is each one receiving the medicine that they need in the hospital, which is the church? Now, uh, if uh, Frank mentioned that you've got a pacemaker, uh, well, did he need his toenails cut in? When he had a paper, but he liked them, really. But he didn't go in for it. For his toenails to be done, he waited for his heart. And if somebody sees life through eyes that, that are just hurting whenever they see, what well, if they need to have clarity of vision? And whatever the person needs, and each one of us, I'm quite sure, uh, if, if we all sat down and said, well, what pills do you want? And uh, said, so, well, well, I'm on this, and, and I'm on that, and, and somebody might say, well, I'm not having any at all. I think it's absolutely amazing. Every time I go to the doctor, they that kind. I go to the shop next door, and they give me more sweeties. They, they call them pills, or medicine, or something. But, you know, so they end up in the morning with a little handful of pills, and a little handful of sweeties. But that's what I need, and what you need is what you need. And it's no use you having my tablets, or me having yours. I'm going to have what I need, and you're going to have what you need. And sometimes the church is oblivious to this. Absolutely oblivious. We need individual medicine. But very often what is given out is the same pill for everybody on a take it or leave it basis. You don't like us. You go somewhere else. And that's not the attitude. That's not the attitude that's needed. Every single person that comes into our meeting is a precious soul. And somehow or other, they are going to need healing. Healing in their spirits, healing in their souls, perhaps healing in their bodies. But you know, the Bible says the cheerful heart is a good medicine. And when we're right with God, then, then there is a natural healing that goes on. You feel better. When you have a good sing on Sunday morning, don't you feel better? Yeah, how often have we gone to, to church on Sunday morning and we felt pretty rough, but we've had a good sing and we've met folks who care for us and you go home just feeling better. A cheerful heart is a good medicine. But we live in a sensitive world. There's a lot of healing that needs to go on. But the church is also a training centre. Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. Who's got that? You've done it twice. We're going to let somebody else do it now. Right. You're, you're too quick, you are. <laughs> Matthew 28. Come on, nice and loud. Who's got this? Thank you very much. The church is a teaching place, a place of education, a training centre. Uh, when, when I was a kid, everybody went to Sunday school. Some church or other. All the churches had Sunday schools. And it's something that's just faded away uh, in our nation, and I think we're poor or poor. Uh, 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 young people don't even know what is their heritage, their national heritage. But also in our churches, we need good training programs. We need people who can train so that we can teach others that they may teach others also. People need to know the stories of Jesus. One of the things that we found in Coach Kinabalu was that they had no idea what was going on in the Old Testament. They never ever looked at the Old Testament. I mentioned the tabernacle one day. I said, what do you know about the tabernacle? Nothing. Absolutely ridiculous spot. <laughs> they knew nothing. And so all the things that the, the New Testament talks about, in reference to the old, they hadn't got clue. They had no foundation for understanding it. And that just broke my heart. 
But the church is a training centre and it needs to be a business that's geared up for training young people and not just become an old people's home. Sometimes, even the young people are sitting on chairs in the meetings, a bit like the old folks are in an old people's home, and they're all sitting around the walls, watching the television and falling asleep. Yeah. And then, of course, you have, uh, you have a good number of members who did fall asleep during the sermons. Uh, but, you know, what is the church all about? Do we suitably present lessons? in such a way that every age can enjoy? Or is it just geared up for one group of people in the church? And that takes skill. Multi-age presentations. And one of the follow-up courses like, uh, our children, when they're in school, but joyfully have another day off school, and they call this an insect day. A training day. And what would happen if our teachers never had any extra training and yet in our churches, congregation after congregation, when the leaders are not being retrained or, or geared up, they, they, they know the stories from Sunday school 50, 60 years ago, but they are not being retrained and we all need to be retrained all the time. The church needs to be a palace. We are going to learn this this year. We are going to study and not just Genesis to Revelation, but how to interact with people. How to develop our communication skills. Who are we dealing with in our own community? What are the people who live the other side of the street? What are the problems in uh, in this, this particular area that where we are. Very often, church leaders haven't got a clue who, 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 what, what other churches there are around about. They haven't got a clue who the, the, the local councillors are. They haven't got a clue what the, the town planners have in mind. And that the church has divorced itself from society. Well, we can't do that. We just can't. Nobody might like this airy fairy business of people coming in and hearing what we've got to say and accepting it and doing what we would like them to do. But that is not how life works. And I'm not talking about any change of doctrine here, but a change of attitude amongst those who are believers in Christ. Now somebody read for me. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 19. <coughs> Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. Fish for people. How many of you people here, men or women, have ever caught a fish? Yeah, one, one or two, one or two, yes, yes, yes. Well, we've been there several times and not caught fish as well. <laughs> but it's great when you can catch a fish. Jesus says, I want you to catch, I want you to go out fishing for men. But some of us are not very good with casting our reels out. We're not so bad inside, but we're not so good outside. When things are different, when it's a different river place. But Jesus says, I want you to be fishers of men. I want you to go and catch them. But sometimes, we're a bit like, uh, well, we, we don't get them so much now, do we? The wet fish shop. Who remembers when you'd have a, a proper shop and it would be, be filled with wet fish? And you just have little counters there, perhaps in Tesco or something like that. Uh, uh, again, on our travels when we were in, in Borneo, we went down to the market and they had whole stalls of gazillions of different fish there that, that we never even seen. And then the boats that had come into the port, they'd uploaded their, their fish onto the, the net and you could get your fish and then they'd cook it for you right there and there. That was fresh fish. Oh, and it was lovely. It was grand. But you know, what stinks after it's been rained just a little while? Oh, it's fish, isn't it? 
When a fish is you know, dying, he's it's hungry around, a man that stinks. And sometimes the church is a little bit like that. Sometimes uh, we can go to the supermarket and we buy a fish, and what do we do? Well, we go down to the frozen fish counter, which fills up the bulk of the taste, and then we'll buy it in breadcrumbs, and we'll, we'll buy it ready battered, <laughs> and, and so our calories go off all over the place. And it usually tastes of absolutely nothing. And then if you go to a local fish chip shop, it might be a good one, but the bulk of them will be filled with grease. What does the seller care as long as he makes a sale? Well, usually not a great thing. The Jesus says, I will make you fishers of men. Now, how many times have we been out fishing? Well, if you haven't been fishing, you can't catch a fish. And if you want fishing for souls, then you can't buy them in Tesco's. And it takes some effort. And it takes some time. I don't think there are many fishermen, even the good ones, that just flip that rod out there and, oh, there's a fish. Hold it in and flip it out and hold it in and flip it out and hold it in. It just doesn't work like that, does it? No. Very often they're there for hours and hours or even days before they catch something. But do they get in? No, they don't. Jesus said, he wants us to be fishers of men. Now, when Paul wrote to, to Titus, he said, the reason I left you in Crete was that you might. The trouble is with some churches, they don't. They don't do a whole lot. And I'm worried about that. Some of our churches are dead on their feet. Chapel doors might be open, there might be money, money in the bank. But life, there is no life there. And it's heartbreaking. Then you know, you've got to get some pills from the doctor. Give you, give you a heart transplant. A heavenly heart transplant. A new thinking regime up in your mind. So that we can think more abundantly and he will add that to that so that he can so he will be thinking more beyond that but you see sometimes we don't think I had a thought once but I didn't like it so I've tried not to have another one since <laughs> and that's a good number of our churches are just like that isn't it how many of our church buildings are in poor condition they're freezing cold in winter they're dreary to look at they got a little notice board that you can't even see, uh, and, and has no connection with the place where it is. How many church members are blind to businesses? How many churches are inward looking? Well, we do it this way. Went to one congregation and said, Well, we can't do it that way because we do it this way. Don't talk to me about it, but that's the way we do it. We can't change it. Preachers very often know the word. But they are, are not good at presenting the word. We have some good teachers in the church. No, no, many preachers. And people eat with their eyes. That's something I learned very early in my catering career. Is that people eat with their eyes. If you don't look good, they don't want it. It has to look good. And the church has to look good. How often... Has the investment in the business of the church been so low that the congregations have come to ask somebody else to help them pay the electricity bill? And I wonder if the fire extinguisher is being used so that the thrill factor of going to the assembly has just been extinguished. Is Sunday morning a thrill and a delight? Or is it a repeat performance of what's gone on for the last 50 years? Business succeeds where everyone knows what's going on and everybody works together for the good of the customer. And they know their customers by name. 
because the boss of our company knows us by name. He has written our names in a book of life, and he has us engraved on the palm of his hand. God knows his business. Jesus was about God's business, and we need to be about that same business. So, let me encourage you. If you are part of the congregation, that needs to be straightened out like the church in Crete. And straighten it out. Have a go. Smile and enjoy your time of worship. Be bigger than you are. Be bolder than you ever could be. Sing louder. Pray harder. Laugh more. Be the people that God wants you to be. And when we are constantly rejoicing in the Lord, and I'll say it again, rejoice in the Lord, then perhaps difficulties with living sobriety, I don't even know to touch you, that's all to do with booze. Uh, uh, but we can live happily. We can live righteously. And we'll certainly live God love. But you know, we have all the animals on the face of the earth. There's only us that can smile. There's only us that laughs. God created us to enjoy life. Enjoy it with the Lord Jesus Christ. And may God bless you and keep you. Amen.